Whoever you are, from wherever you come, you are welcome here. Whomever you love, whatever family means to you, you are welcome. The identities you hold, how you want to be called, and your pronouns are respected and welcome here. Whatever the color of your skin, the language your grandparents spoke, the cultures that move in you, whatever your abilities and disabilities, we welcome you. Whatever you believe, whatever your theology, prayer, or sacrament, even if none at all, we welcome you. Whether you are here in person, joining us from home, or zooming in from wherever your life journey has taken you, we welcome you. We join together in Unitarian Universalist principles. We are a community of communities, spiritual seekers acting out our faith in justice, united in covenant and the spirit of love. We welcome all of you. Good morning. Welcome to Unitarian Universalist Church West on this glorious, uh, sort of wintry, sort of springy-ish day. <laughs> this morning we are going to be reflecting deeply on our human relationship to nature, how and even whether we truly believe that any ecosystem has a right, a legal right, to exist, flourish, regenerate its vital cycles without human-caused destruction. So in that light, as we gather here and online, let us acknowledge who and where we are on this abundant land and all of its beings to whom we are meaningfully related, past and present. We do so because it is important to understand the long-standing history that has brought us to, the, to reside here and to seek to understand our place within that history. We reside within the traditional territories of the native peoples of the Seven Councils tribe, Ho-Chunk, Kickapoo, Potawatomi, Menominee, Peoria, and Miami nations. This recognition does not exist in the past tense or historical context. Colonialism and white supremacy are a current ongoing process against indigenous, black, and people of color, and we know this. So here at UUCW, we commit ourselves to becoming an anti-racist faith community dedicated to equity, racial justice, and right relations. Our spiritual wholeness and the building of beloved community are joined to our actions that accountably dismantle racism and other oppressions. My name is Lynn Capitan, and I'm a member of your board of trustees. The pronouns I use are she and her. I have a bad cold this morning, and so does Eddie. <laughs> so we're wearing masks, and we're gonna try to uh, not falter in our ability to project this morning. Uh, little grandchildren can do this to you. <laughs> if you are a visitor, you, I, we hope that you feel welcome here. If you would like to connect or ask a question, talk to me after the service or send an email to visitor at uucw.org. You can connect with us by using the welcome form uh, that you found in your uh, order of service when you came in. The other side of that yellow form is a place where you can share your personal joys and sorrows. You can place that form, whether to connect or to share, in the offering baskets or later, uh, later on, or uh, in the box at the side table. There's also a QR code uh, on your order of service to share something electronically. Note that the community room is available if you need to step out. There's a TV there that's set up to view and hear the service. There's also an activity uh, table over there for anyone who feels a little restless or even creative. All, all ages are welcome in the sanctuary. Now there's a lot of announcements in your order of service and they're all important, but I'd like to highlight a, a couple, uh, draw your attention to. First, for those of you who are members of UUCW, please expect a phone call this week from a member of the Board of Trustees. Yes, we are reaching out to every member to invite your nominations of people you think should be on the team that will give us the greatest possible success 
in the search for our new settled minister in the coming year. Or don't wait for the call and send in your nomination today. The link is uh, in last week's e-news, I believe. And speaking of nominations, please visit the nominating committee table after service to find out more about how you can help us support the church through service on the board, and nom uh, nominating committees, and endowment committees. All questions are welcome, so please stop by. And finally, we are getting close to the end of our annual pledge drive, but we still need about half of our members to make the pledge and send it in. I hate to say this, including me and Eddie. <laughs> We've talked about it, but we haven't done it. It's very easy to forget, so please don't forget. In fact, we can make it easy. Why not take your phone out right now? <laughs> take your phone out right now and send an email to vickyb at uucw.org with a number that Vicki can confidentially record as your pledge for the coming year. It's that simple. Do you have questions or need more information uh, to help you decide on your pledge? We still have two amazing remaining uh, cottage meetings, one on April 2nd, right after the service, and one on April 4th on Zoom. And th these meetings have been really great. Everyone who's attended has told us how great they are. They're fun and lively and informative sessions that um, give you an opportunity to see how each of us fits into the bigger picture of creating a sustainable UUCW. So please don't miss these meetings. Um, and please know that we appreciate all your gifts, not solely your pledge, but your time, energy, and presence here in our community. It really is a privilege to gather together and to attend to the things that matter in life. You all are welcome here. Good morning again. My name is Eddie Daniel. My pronouns are he and him. As a member of the worship ministry team, it is my privilege to be leading the service today. Our guest speaker is Guy Ryder, or Anakwet in his native language. Anakwet is a traditional Menominee who resides on the Menominee Reservation. He's the executive director of a Menominee Indian community organization called Mini Kanakam. I hope I said that right. He's also a community organizer, activist, author, amateur archaeologist, and lecturer. Busy. Anakwet has organized many events that have uplifted the human condition and demonstrated how enriching Menominee culture is. He's lectured at universities on the connection Menominee Indians have to the Menominee River. He's also written articles for environmental health news and other publications. When Anakwet isn't working, you'll find him enjoying time with his partner and their children. Anakwet has an, is an advocate for indigenous people everywhere. And now, please stand in body or in spirit as we sing hymn number 163, For the Earth Forever Turning. <laughs>
We light this chalice, spark of the original fire of creation, to remind us that we, we all on this planet, those with fur, with feathers, with fins, and with scales, along with us who have no feathers, fins, or scales, we all share a common destiny. We all share the same hopes for a life free from harm and suffering, and the same aspirations of happiness and love, being able to express our own uniqueness as best we may. We are all intertwined, interconnected, and interdependent, and it is good. Blessed be. Hope you've all been enjoying the love letters to UUCW that we've been hearing for the past few weeks. We have two more to share with you this morning. Good morning, I'm Elmuth Sophie. And yes, I've enjoyed the letters that I've heard before and they've given me the courage to share mine with you. I begin, dear UUCW, it was 1976 when I walked through these doors the very first time, but I wasn't ready to be part of this community, so I left after a few years. And so I became a spiritual wanderer for many years, until 2003, I wanted to sing in the choir, and so I came back. On that first Sunday when I came back, people I hadn't seen for over 25 years greeted me warmly and welcomed me. And it was then that I knew I was home. Now more than 20 years have gone by since I came back to you. And I've come to love you ever more. Any faults you may have are far outweighed by your love, your resilience, and your strength. You have inspired me with your sermons, adult enrichment programs, and the opportunity to serve the wider community and the lived lives of so many of you. You invited me to lend my talents and passions to the worship ministry team, nominating and endowment committees, and the earth ministry team. Above all, you have encouraged me to discover and live my values. You let me bestow a great legacy to my grandchildren by allowing them to serve meals at the guest house right alongside me. You brought me Wellspring, the spiritual deepening, uh, the sp spiritual deepening for the UU soul. I've been fortunate to be part of the Wellspring program for over five years, and my UU faith has grown ever stronger with the deep connections between members of our circle. A circle which brought me through the deep, the, uh, the isolation brought on by COVID. Yes, you were always there for me during the good times and the bad. My open heart surgery, blood cancer, and my grief after the death of a loved one required medical treatment and the passing of time to heal. But it was through your support, thoughts and prayers, cards, visit, and yes, delicious meals, that I survived and thrived. I'm so grateful for all the people who came before me and who are here right now, all who make it possible to be in this community together. And I want others to have that same opportunity to give and receive, to learn and to grow. Yet I know that without the space to house our congregation, our loving community would wither and die. As in all the previous years, you have asked, now are asking me to make a financial pledge so our wonderful staff can be adequately compensated. We can provide programs for all the people for all ages and keep our lights on and yes, fix the roof on our house of worship. Today, I, 20 years later, I still sing in the choir, thanks to Reuben and all the wonderful people that have joined the choir over the years. 
and we all make the commitment to show up and do our best. And so when it comes to pledging, I also make that same commitment to show up and do my best, which simply means to look deep inside and pledge the most I can give. And love demands that of me. Good morning, I am Kathy White. My pronouns are she and her. <clears throat> Dear UUCW, I tried many paths before arriving at your doors. Although mostly Catholic, I've also been Episcopalian, Methodist, Unity Church, Wiccan, and New Age. <laughs> when I walked through these doors, I felt tired of searching and curious about the UU way. <clears throat> you welcomed me and invited me to keep coming back. So I have. Uh, it wasn't long before I took the introductory classes and signed the book. I was drawn to unity circles and adult education classes. By joining committees, I began to understand what community and friendship felt like. Being gay felt normal here, and my life partner and I basked in the acceptance and genuine harmony of this community. My time in Soul Matters, Wellspring, lay pastoral care, choir, nominating committee, and greeters, to name some, <laughs> has given me a strong connection to many of you. I've loved coming to Sunday services, listening to beautiful music and inspiring sermons. Dinners in the home groups gave me opportunities to meet members in small groups while enjoying great meals. I believe you are the first church I've ever wanted to attend and be involved with, rather than going because I'm told to. On the worship ministry team, I learned to work with our minister, the guest speaker, and staff to create meaningful services, both in person and online. In a sermon writing class, I discovered that the planning and research involved in drafting an inspiring sermon, it was delightful to actually give my sermon to the congregation during a Sunday service. One of my favorite experiences has been being in the writer's circle. What a privilege to listen to others' pieces and share my own. Our group of women show strong, accepting support and encouragement to one another. We have gotten to know each other better because of our shared creativity. Recently, I've gotten involved in the Wednesday morning meditation group. There is a felt energy when we are all together in silence, followed by engaging conversation. Kathy and I married here last summer. What a glorious day. It was to have family and friends of different faiths present to celebrate our love and commitment to each other. A UU wedding is truly a beautiful experience. I just got chills. <laughs> we shared our ceremony for you online because you all have given us the courage to be ourselves and live authentically. When I think about what you mean to me, I feel so grateful to be in such a loving, vibrant community. Even the children look happy <laughs> heading for religious education. The name tags have helped me learn your names more quickly than I could have ever imagined. I don't get lost in the crowd here, a feeling I often had in other churches. Being so naturally accepted and welcomed here has helped me grow in my love and acceptance of you. I'm so glad to be here with all of you and all of you online. <laughs> uh, Kathy and I always discuss what we're going to do about our pledge each year, and most years we have upped our pledge. And uh, sometimes I think there's a couple of years where we needed to stay the same, but we try very much to up our pledge each year because what we found here is priceless and so life-giving.
Our reading today is excerpted from The Rights of Nature, A Legal Revolution That Could Save the World, by David R. Boyd. Humans today have a deeply troubled relationship with other animals and species, and with the ecosystems upon which all life on Earth depends. We purport to love animals, but regularly inflict pain and suffering upon them. Scientists are in agreement that human actions are causing the sixth mass extinction in the 4.5 billion year history of the planet. Humans are damaging, destroying, or eliminating entire ecosystems, including native forests, grasslands, coral reefs, and wetlands. Ancient, complex, and vital planetary systems, the climate, water, and nitrogen cycles are being disrupted by our actions. Our ongoing use and misuse of other animals, species, and nature is rooted in three entrenched and related ideas. The first is anthropocentrism, the widespread human belief that we are separate from and superior to the rest of the natural world. The second is that everything in nature, animate and inanimate, constitutes our property, which we have the right to use as we see fit. The third idea is that we can and should pursue limitless economic growth as the paramount objective of modern society. Anthropocentrism and property rights provide the foundations of contemporary industrial society, underpinning everything from law and economics to education and religion. Economic growth is the principal objective for governments and businesses, and it consistently trumps concerns about the environment. The idea that nature is merely a collection of things intended for human use is one of the most universal and unquestioned concepts in contemporary society. In addition to owning all the land, humans claim ownership of the species that live upon that land. Animals are regarded as property, things, or objects, no different in the eyes of the law than shoes, tables, or trinkets. This includes both domestic and wild animals. We've divided the diversity of life on Earth into two categories, people and things, us and them. We're the only species with rights to the land, water, wildlife, and ecosystems of the planet. To say we share this planet with millions of other species is ecologically incontrovertible, but legally incorrect. There are exceptions to the widespread beliefs of human superiority, property rights, and the primacy of economic growth. A contrasting perspective asserting that non-human entities have rights and that humans have corresponding responsibilities has deep roots in indigenous cultures around the world. Despite centuries of Western colonial thought, many still perceive human beings as interdependent, part of rather than separate from and superior to the rest of the natural world. A key element of the legal systems of many indigenous cultures is a set of reciprocal rights and responsibilities between humans and other species, as well as between humans and non-living elements of the environment. The hour is late. Human actions have unleashed a tsunami of death and destruction upon the planet. Not only our laws, but also our cultures require a fundamental reorientation, transforming humans from conquerors of nature to members of the planet's community of life. Perhaps in the nick of time, a global movement has emerged, calling for acknowledgement of the fact that individual animals, wild species, and nature have rights that humans are morally obligated to respect and protect. Propelled by the global environmental crisis, the rights of nature movement has the potential to create a world where people live in genuine harmony with nature.
Poso. Why when in its case pian um on a quit nit takam wa pasha nit totam kashitna in its ki wakin why when in mau ni wea ke osa itua nichi anak wa panuki mashikta o peto skunik ne na mosu kane matamo um so my name is a uh, guy writer um my real name is onaquit um as you can tell that that word translates to brilliant and amazing amazing <laughs> man very handsome um all all of those good things but i think if you were to ask anybody else and possibly look it up it might say cloudy skies but <laughs> that's not the way i translate it um <clears throat> my uh my name was um given to me by my grandfather many 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 years ago when i was young while well, it seems many now um that i've kind of gotten a little bit older and longer in the tooth um but uh i'm the executive director like was said of an organization called mini konakim located on our manamani indian reservation um we have about 80 acres there uh, we we have uh buffalo um that we've just reintroduced back to our land um we grow a heck of a lot of food we have a pretty amazing youth group there and and uh do a lots of environmental uh, advocacy and and environmental justice and uh in that justice work in that that uh sort of arena we we started to uh, oppose a, a sulfide mine located uh it's a potential sulfide mine it isn't it isn't there yet um are going to be actually uh it's on the manamani uh river which is our home river as manamanis that's where we come from as a people that's where our oral history says that we came out of the earth there um some of you may or may not know that we are the longest living inhabitants you know of this place they call Wisconsin we've been here longer than all other tribes um but this particular particular project uh called the Back 40 mine has been in the process for a long time uh we've been in the fight for probably about i think 12 to 15 years of it but it's been longer um it still hasn't gone on and and we've defended our land and and other organizations have have uh, stepped in and helped and and it's been an it's been a long thing long battle but uh there are some light at the end of that tunnel hopefully um and I, and i wanted to uh just take a moment you know as as we uh kind of get into this rights of nature um to really really try to come into the room this morning you know to to try to be present here in this time you know it it was uh not that it was hard to get up this morning <laughs> on a sunday morning to drive 3 hours to be here in the morning uh i get up pretty early with my my children who i had mentioned earlier their names um but it was such an honor to see that sun come up this morning and i watch it rise above uh, uh the horizon and it's been a while since i've been able to see that because uh I usually take my kids to school and it's just busy you know but at one time in my life um that was a very big priority of mine is to to be in that time you know with that that beautiful sun and and uh appreciate you know all that it brings and all that it does and 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 uh being able to witness that this morning was a really good memory but i i just want to um have us think of of uh that um uh, beautiful water you know that we have that all of us depend on that all of us probably interacted with this morning whether you were washing your face or brushing your teeth or or drinking your coffee or whatever it is you know that that we actually absolutely depend on the the clean water um and that we take the times of our day to to just thank it you know to to talk about it when you're when you're using it to to let it know how much how much it matters to you um because like i said you know we all depend on it and you know i i um want us to think too of of all those uh all those uh, animals out there all those uh in our language we call them manatoak and and that word can also mean like spirits you know like we see the essence of those of those animals and a lot of us um at home go by clans and and they uh, determine a little bit of like what our responsibilities are and and how we view things um so if we could you know maybe we just take three breaths together 
you know, here this morning. And, and uh, I would ask that you at least feel um, your clothes on your, on your body. Try to uh, be here in this moment to be in communion with our beautiful mother who's right underneath us, you know, this earth. And she's never, never far from us, right? She's always lifting us up and holding us up. And that uh, we, we remind ourselves of that beautiful connection with her. That um, a lot of times when people are struggling or having a hard time, it's our beautiful mother that, that uh, takes us in her her uh, warm embrace, you know, and we all find that comfort along, whether it's a shore of a lake or whether it's in the forest or a mountain or whatever it is. But um, we want to, I want to make sure that we just think of those things and then I'm going to get into this, I promise. <laughs> so I want to do just three breaths together if we can go in our, in our nose and, and out our, our mouth and uh, just try to be present. Ready? In. Hold. Out. In, hold, out. Last one. In, hold, out. Oh, my wanan. Welcome. Poso. <clears throat> so you kind of heard that in the in the uh, article a little bit about what rights of nature is in. Um, you know, I could go on and on. It's a big subject, and, and it's still getting um, kind of defined. It's it's an old term, but but new too as well. But uh, uh, the rights of nature um, protects rivers, mountains, ecosystems, and the life uh, life forms that support them uh, by recognizing its legal rights. Just as humans and corporations are considered to have rights. Uh, this legal framework grants rights to nature itself. Rights of nature frameworks turn the existing property rights um, based paradigm upside down and offer a powerful basis and strategy to conserve lands and communities. Uh, they also offer a radically different worldview. The rights of uh, the right of nature to exist, persist, flourish, and evolve. Now, <clears throat> doing what I do. And being involved in the um, environmentalism, environmental justice, I don't know how many are out there that, that are a part of that, but um, it always seems to be that you're on the defense. You know, you're always reacting to whatever the companies are doing or whatever sometimes the government or the, even the local municipalities are doing. Um, you're always, always trying to, to react to whatever it is they're doing. Um, what I learned is, is I thought when I first came in and I was a young, handsome, you know, naive young man, um, that uh, all we had to do was like use the Water Act. That's all we had to do, right? These environmental laws are, are here, Clean Water, Clean Air Act, all these things. And then when I read the, the Clean Water Act, it was so disappointing. I, I can almost picture that moment in my life where I was like, what is this? This isn't anything what I thought it was. Um, as is a lot of our environmental laws that I'm sure some of you that are in the game understand and, and some that are learning about these kind of things now. These uh, um, environmental laws aren't designed to, to protect anything, actually. They're, they're quite the opposite. They allow, they allow contamination. They allow all these things that, that are currently being done here um, up to a certain point, but a lot of times it goes above and beyond. Um, and then there's really, they call reclamation and all these key words that they use to, to be able to um, destroy an ecosystem. And that's basically what, it, what, what, it, what happens. Um, so the rights of nature is, for, for me anyway, is, is a, a very old concept that was um, come through our culture, come through our language, come through the Creator, you know, in, in uh, this language that I speak, in this language that you're understanding as I'm speaking it, is a foreign language. The language I spoke before when I introduced myself is not a foreign language. It language is from here. That's where it comes from. And um, this language that I speak is, is a very uh, 
Fear-based language, this language, this English language, it, it's like a deficit thinking language. It sees problems and it whole, builds whole things around, around those problems. You know, our languages are, are, are not like that. Um, our language is uh, the Menominee. The Menominee language is a sacred language, but it, it comes from a place of uh, connection and it comes from a place of love. I was told by our, our ancestors that uh, the Creator gave us our language out of love for us as a people. And that's the same way that we should give it and when we speak it and when we talk it, you know, we should be in that, that space, you know, of love and, and compassion. I can't say that about this English language, you know, I, I never signed up to learn English. I, I was a bit forced upon me, but um, as I got older, I was able to be conversational in our language and have an understanding of, of our language and it changed my life completely. Changed the way I see things, changed the way I understand things and the way I feel, um, the way I dream you know, as a, as a person. <clears throat> and these, these rights of nature, you know, go right along with that. You know, the, the, I'll tell you the word that we have um, for a deer in our language is a passus. And uh, if you were to break that word down, it, it um, roughly translates to uh, the one with the warm spirit. And it was our people understanding what that deer did in our life and the, and the benefits that it it gave us with tools and clothing and, and all the things that it did. So um, our people honored that animal and seen it as not as a resource or something that I want to get the big horns from, but uh, as a relative, as, as someone that uh, we co-depend on each other, right? Those kind of things. Um, how much time do I have? <laughs> do I have, how much? Holy smokes, I better get into it, okay. <laughs> so, um, the very first uh, rights of nature law, so this is, like I said, relatively new. The very first law that was ever written and put into to law was uh, in 2006 in uh, Pennsylvania. Um, there, there was a community there that was fighting against, I believe it was, uh, they were taking a PCB dredge from the, from the river and they were putting it in their community without them agreeing to do it. And, and uh, there, was a, there was a movement there to, to protect, um, I always get their name, it's like Tamaraqua Burl, I think, in uh, Ohio. Um, I think it's north of Philadelphia or either west, one of the two don't, you might have to look it up. But uh, anyway, that, that was the very first uh, law that was written uh, on rights of nature, recognizing you know, the, the uh, river and, and also the, the area and the forest there. Um, this rights of nature movement was started in 2006, but like I said, you know, it's, it, it goes back many, many generations um, for us as indigenous people. And um, there's a lot of communities after, you know, the Ohio um, passed the rights of nature, there, there's been others, of course, and, and Ecuador was the, the very first country to actually put it into their constitution. And uh, some of the folks that worked in Pennsylvania um, drafting those laws actually went down and, and worked in Ecuador to be able to help um, those folks put it into their constitution. Um, that happened, you know, in 2008, so two years after that. Um, there's others that I just want to briefly mention um, in 2010, Bolivia, you know, put it into their, uh, well, they actually created the Universal Declaration of the Rights of Mother Earth. Um, I just want to touch on a few here. So in, in uh, New Zealand in 2014, um, they had the first state constitutional amendment to include the rights of nature. Uh, it was proposed in Colorado, like I said, in the US. And uh, right now there, there's the efforts similar to that are, are being advanced in Ohio, um, Oregon, New Hampshire, and, and, and other states. And I'm hoping at some point we're gonna have Wisconsin on that list. Um, I don't know how many of you are familiar with, with the Prove It First law. Have, ever, have ever you, any of you ever heard that by a show of hands? No? Does anybody remember, uh, you guys are pretty far south, but I, I would imagine you remember the, the Crandon mine fight, the fight against Exxon. 
So up there in Mole Lake at the headwaters of the Wolf River and, and close to the Menominee Reservation where I'm from, they, uh, uh, the, the group of, of um, it was a weird time too, because if you remember, it was right after the, like the Chippewa uh, hunting and fishing rights and it was real contested up there and there was definitely a divide within communities. Um, but it seemed like the, the fight against Exxon Mine uh, really um, bridged a gap and, and, and brought us together. So there was Indians, non-Indians that came together. There was a whole big f movement there. Anyway, long story short, I got 10 minutes, probably less now, but um, they, they created uh, a prove it first law. And uh, basically what the law was, um, was you, if you were gonna do any kind of extract extractive uh, uh, industries were going to come in here like a mine, you had to prove that you operated a mine somewhere else in the country. It couldn't be like a third world country. It had to be a first world um, country. And you had to uh, prove that you, you had a mine there for 10 years and that after that um, you didn't pollute your environment uh, after that, which is basically a mining moratorium because there's no way they can do that, right? which is an amazing, amazing thing. It's such a common sense law, it's, it's unbelievable. So about uh, two or three years ago, there's a gentleman by the name of uh, Tom Tiffany, who's now our Congress uh, Senator, um, who we called back in them days and still call him Toxic Tom. Um, I hope he's watching. I, I, I really got a lot of words for that gentleman. But um, he uh, was able to rescind that, that law and uh, it got repealed, and, and now I think we're like in our second year or third year um, without that law. And uh, now we're facing, you know, mining permits that are coming up in, in many different areas here in Wisconsin that never would have stood a chance if we would have kept that law in place. And sometimes it's amazing to me that uh, uh, one person can, can move something like that where, where hundreds of people, you know, worked on it and, and put it in place. And, you know, the funny thing is, is that when it was um, running through Congress back in the late 80s, early 90s, you know, Governor, well, it wasn't Governor Scott Walker at the time, but he was a, a senator and, and he signed on and, and many, many Republicans signed on to that, to that law. But the, the, the good thing is, is that uh, I hope through uh, some of our work with, with uh, Rights of Nature that we can revisit something like that. And um, I know the state of Minnesota, some of the folks from the Friends of the Boundary Waters have, are actually uh, pushing that through their, their Congress right now. The, it's the exact same law as ours was, the Prove It First law. But um, so, you know, the, the, the environmental laws that are here are, are uh, not designed to, to really protect us or, or, you know, look to the future. And, and um, Rights of Nature has that opportunity. We have the opportunity to not only um, work with tribes, but uh, have a, a bit of, of indigenous understanding within our laws. You know, I could tell you what I said, you know, uh, con this language is, is a very, very, uh, um, I would say pitiful language. It, it can't even describe very basic things in our language, but it, it's it's up to us to, to understand that, right? Understand that what this, this language brings, and anybody that speaks another language knows exactly what I'm talking about. Um, and, and that we can view these things not as, not as uh, resources or property rights, but that we can actually see them you know, as, as relatives, or that we can see that we come from them, right? And they come from us, and that we co-inhabit this, this world together, and they're just as much needed as, as we are. Um, there are some things that are happening now um, with the Rights of Nature movement, um, we have started uh, lots of things uh, working with tribes. I work with our organization, uh, the acronyms are CEDER, C-D-E-R, uh, which is the Community of, or no, Center of Democratic Environmental Rights. Um, they were some of the folks that were very instrumental in writing the first and drafting the first laws here in, in the country, and, and also they've uh, helped with Ecuador. And uh, another, uh, case right now that's really important is uh, uh, over in uh, White Earth uh, in Minnesota right now, they drafted a law that's called the Rights of Manuman. And uh, Manuman is the Anishinaabe word for wild rice. And um, <clears throat> they're very dependent on it. It was within their treaty rights. They, they cared so much for that, that plant. And um, 
they passed a law recognizing that this wild rice in our treaties, you know, uh, we have to have this to exist. And if you, if you um, contaminate all our rice, you're, you're breaking our treaties, basically what it is. So right now they, they have sued uh, the state of Minnesota. Um, uh, a lot of it is because of um, line three, you know, the, the pipeline that they put in, they, they gave them a permit to, to do all these things and, and uh, they didn't even, you know, ask the tribes or have any consultation in that regard when it came to the rights of Manuman law that the tribe had. So that's working its way through through the court system and, and uh, the rights of nature movement in the, is, is a very uh, young and it's in its infancy. So there's not a whole lot of, of law on the books about it, which is good sometimes, which is bad. You know what I mean? I guess it depends on the way you think about it. But um, what's, what's exciting about it is the opportunity that it brings that uh, folks from both sides of the aisle, um, folks from many walks of life that we could come together um, with nature in mind and, and really draft something that speaks for all of us. And uh, I feel like to me, it's, it's the tribes have, uh, have a, maybe a bigger stick when it comes to it because they have sovereignty, they have um, treaties that were, that were with the government. And I feel like that we could learn a bit from the tribes and work with them and, and, and really, really push this, uh, this movement forward. Um, and so just in closing, I, I just wanted to say that uh, um, we also work with a, a group um, called Wisdom, or I do, uh, Wisdom. They're uh, like faith-based organizations. And I see a lot of shaking heads, so I'm sure you know who they are. And I know Bob is, is here and, and uh, I work with him. Um, he developed an amazing website. Uh, right now, we have a group there that's, that's been putting some things, but it's still in its infancy. And uh, we're looking to expand as we kind of get, get going a little bit more. Um, the, the website was what, Bob? Rights of Nature, No Punctuation, WI.org. So Rights of Nature, WI.org. And it's a fantastic website, and, and Bob did a really good job on it. But if you go to that website, uh, it'll show you kind of like where our meetings are and what we're doing and, and, and where we're at. Um, and it, of course, if you wanted to know more about rights of nature, I mean, it's, a, it's kind of self-explanatory in some ways when you think about it. And, uh, but it's more for me, I, I was told something when I first started to, uh, well, here, I'll just leave you with this. Uh, when I first heard of, of this potential back 40 mine on the Menominee River, um, I was I was just like man somebody's got to do something right, so so I went to the uh, a meeting they were having about it, and uh, learned everything I could there, wrote everything down, came back home and I was just fired up about it right, and uh, I was talking to our leadership and actually I was talking to some of our uh, traditional folks up there on, at home, a lot of them are my relatives that, and I remember talking to one of my uncles there after a, a ceremony and I was telling him you know what man, somebody should be writing letters, you know? Somebody should be doing these meetings and, and somebody should be putting the word out and somebody should be doing this and somebody should be doing that. And after he let me go on and on, he looked me dead in my eye and he said, well, you're somebody. <laughs> and I was like, shoot, that's right. <laughs> that's right, I am. I am somebody. So I got to work, right? I didn't really have a plan or, or uh, an idea of like, this is what I want it to look like but I just tried to try to follow my heart and, and what I felt at that time is just follow the creator and it'll lead the, lead the path. And it makes me um, think of, of us here now in this room together. You know, there's something that brought us all here together right at this moment in time and uh, that we're, we're living in a, in a time where it, it seems is pretty chaotic and sometimes can be scary. But what I value about our elders and what I value about our older folks is you guys remember a time when you could ride your bikes in your neighborhood and, and uh, you didn't have to worry. Everybody knew each other and you went fishing and you had got to experience this amazing, amazing place here that they call Wisconsin. And, you know, a lot of our young people don't have that opportunity now, you know, because of, of the current environmental laws and the direction in which we're going as a country. So we definitely need your wisdom. We definitely need your, your vision and, and uh, you know, your strength too. That, that's one thing I've, uh, my grandpa, was, I loved him dearly as a World War II vet. He was a tough SOB, you know, and a lot of those guys in them days were, you know, because they had to be. And, 
but also they had an extreme appreciation for uh, for the earth and you know I'm hoping that you guys bring that you know to to some of the the talks and things we're doing so uh that's about all I got about rights of nature and and I just wanted to thank you guys you know for being here um, thank you for uh, listening to me and I appreciate the invite uh, to come down here and share this message and I hope that uh, I see you guys you know in the future when we're looking at Bob's uh, website and, and coming to our meetings or doing whatever it is you know we need to do because I feel like the only way we're going to get better is if we stand shoulder to shoulder and, and make it better Hello. thank you Guy really looking forward to talking to you more after the service in the community room and of course uh, you'll probably be mobbed because your message is wonderful a wonderful way to contemplate today Vivant Health is our split the plate partner for March um, and operates the nation's only recognized HIV medical home the comprehensive patient care model is offered right here in downtown Milwaukee and is successful at helping patients reach a suppressed viral load, allowing them to live a long, healthy life while limiting the spread of the virus. Very crucially important medical care. Um, and they have many success stories. And one uh, success story is of a 59-year-old, primarily Spanish-speaking uh, Hispanic male, who entered the hospital for severe pneumonia. The patient had been HIV positive for a long time, but had, neg had a negative experience with healthcare settings, which led him to reject care. A Vivant Health linkage to care specialist visited, visited him regularly in the hospital to build rapport in his native language and then witnessed firsthand how poorly he was treated by medical professionals. She advocated strongly for the client. Based on the trust she had built with him, the care specialist was able to get the client to build a similar rapport and trusting relationship with his Vivant uh, Health medical home care team. And now he is HIV undetectable for the first time in his life. Your support of Vivant Healthcare can help create more success stories like this one. Here at UUCW, Split Plate is our way to fulfill our UU values and to reach out to the community. If you are participating virtually, go to our website, uucw.org, click on Donate, and select the Split the Plate from the menu. Or you can text or email your donation today using the information found here. I thank you for your generosity to Vivant Health. We will now gratefully accept your offering.
And now please stand in body or in spirit and sing with us hymn number 27, I Am That Great and Fiery Force. for Human Creativity by our former minister, Denise Cawley. As we go forward into this exciting, confusing, frightening, miraculous world, let us love our earth. Take action to respect nature in all of its forms, plants, animals, grasslands, wetlands, mountains, rivers, oceans. Let us consume less, use less energy, and be a cooperative, collaborative, and creative community. Our child, children's lives depend on us. Let us now go in peace.